That's where it all started. With Andrew Breitbart. And he, uh, he passed away in 2012. He got started way 10 years before that. And he approached a friend of his, Larry Solov, and said, let's change the world. My first encounter with, uh, with Andrew Breitbart was when he came to the University of Redlands in September of 2015. And, um, you know, he was, he was kind of this rabble rouser, conservative guy, entertaining, took no guff from anybody. Okay, that was good. But I didn't yet fully appreciate what he was doing. His, this poster here, he signed it at the time, and it was, it was given to the Redlands Tea Party Patriots. We auctioned it. And I am embarrassed to say how much I ended up paying for his autograph poster, but it is for sale. So, so it was interesting. Andrew said, Andrew said that uh, we are in a long war for the soul of America. And he talked about activism. Walk towards the fire. Don't worry about what they call you. All of those things are said because they want to stop you in your tracks. But if you keep going, you're sending a message to people who are rooting for you, who are agreeing with you, that they can do it too. And the left is, and the liberals are still using that tactic. You used to just call us all racist, now we're racist, fascist, Nazis, whatever. Yeah, whatever. After Andrew passed, Steve Bannon took over Bright Park News. And he built it into an organization that with 2 billion page views in 2016. It's the 29th most popular website in the country. It's the 13th most popular Facebook page in the entire world. that any other mainstream media has, and all the comments they have on, on, their, on their pages. There are bureaus in London, Paris, Texas, California, and in the enemy capital city of Washington, D.C. <laughs> they have a, they're on service of uh, Patriot Radio, or Channel 125, and I, I hear that there's going to be some big things coming next. Uh, maybe Joel will be able to give us a hint on, what, on what's coming next. Now, the New York Times of all, I really quote the New York Times, said that in the short annals of journalism, there is no precursor to Breitbart. The way the site appeared to materialize overnight and from the outermost periphery of media dominate the political conversation in the pivotal election. There's some new things, perhaps Joel will tell us, how Breitbart was able to do that. As Trump took office, Van and Steve gave an interview if you think they're going to give you back your country without a fight, you are sadly mistaken. You can sort of see that. Every day is going to be a fight. Well, he recently left the administration and went back and he says that the presidency that we fought for and won is over. Now, there'll be some good things that will come out of President Trump. But that presidency, that disruptive presidency, is over, but in perhaps a warning to everyone else, he says, now I'm free. I have got my hands back on my weapons. <laughs> so, Joe Pollock spoke at the United IE conference and was one of the great speakers there. He, he is co-author of a book, How Trump Won. You can read, he's a senior editor at Breitbart News, and you can read him there. His Twitter feed at Joel Pollock. When uh, Steve, the day that Steve left the administration, he put out a tweet that said hashtag war. That's what Andrew, that was one of Andrew's favorite hashtags. We'll talk about that. When we had him on the radio show a couple weeks back, he said, what was different about Breitbart? We fight. Joel was also a, uh, he started life in South Africa, moved to, immigrated legally to America. Yes, yeah, started on the left and then saw the light and came over and, and, and joined the right. Uh, his one, you know, duty to mention, he did, he, did, he did make an attempt at elected politics. And uh, he, he took on an incumbent Democrat, which of course it would be hard to do in a Democratic district. 
but he narrowly lost that election to the Democratic incumbent by 66 to uh, 31 percent. So I'm sure next time I'll let you know. <laughs> and then you've heard enough, uh, heard enough of me. So with that, I'll we'll turn it over to Joe Pod. Just thank you so much for coming to speak to us. quite moving to see the pictures of Andrew, and I have to say also that the beginning of this meeting was incredibly moving. That film we saw about the Angel Mom resonated with me because, as Greg told you, my family is also a legal immigrant family, and my wife is a legal immigrant, and I have to apologize to you for not speaking here last month. The reason I didn't speak was my wife was suddenly called to do extra duty. You see, she's in the Navy Reserve, and she's an immigrant who volunteered to join our country's military, and she fixes helicopters down in Coronado. So, I had the kids on my own, and couldn't figure out how to work that out, so I had to cancel at the last minute, but she's back home with the kids tonight, having flown around Coronado in those uh, I think they're AC-60s with the HSC-3, the Merlins, they call them. They, they're the search and rescue team of the Navy. And I'm very proud of her. Legal immigrant, very proud American. And it just means so much when I see stories like that. My parents did not live in an oppressive country like Hungary, at least not to them. It was an oppressive country to other people, but my family came from South Africa. The reason my parents came here was they did not want to participate anymore in a country where illegality had become the law. I grew up with that phrase. My father said, you cannot live in a system where illegality becomes the law. And when people talk about DACA and why you should legalize all the illegal people because it's easier, to me, that goes against why my parents came here, why they brought me here as a baby. They could have lived a comfortable life there. They weren't running away necessarily from any kind of persecution but they chose to live in a place where the rule of law prevailed. That was really important to them. And that's why we're here. Anyway, just terrifically moving. Even the Pledge of Allegiance, I found myself choking up a bit because yesterday I took my daughter to kindergarten and she said the Pledge of Allegiance for the first time. So there you go. Anyway, so... I've got a book out, which is one of the reasons I'm here, How Trump Won, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I hope you can all get one. I'm selling them at a discounted price of $15 with an autograph. But I also want to talk about what's really exciting to us, and that's what's in the news right now. And, you know, I, I just want to say I think we're living in an extraordinary time. I think no matter what else you hear from the TV pundits and cable news and talk radio, it's important to remember we are living in an extraordinary time. There has not been a presidency like this for more than 150 years, maybe longer. In fact, I was in the room when Donald Trump won. I was at the election night party. And the journalists were flipping out. Just completely crazy. And it's a really funny story that I tell in the book. In fact, there were a lot of nervous Breitbart people there. I went up to Matt Boyle, our political editor. I said, how's he doing? It was about 7.30 in the evening. It felt like, a fu felt like a funeral, right? Because Frank Luntz had just gone on Twitter. He had seen all the exit polls, and he said, Hillary Clinton will be the next president of the United States. So it wasn't looking good. I said to Matt, well, how's it looking? And he gave me this cold stare, and he said, Trump's going to lose. And I said to Raheem Kassam, our London editor, well, what do you think? Because he's a veteran of these political fights. And he, he points to the TV screen and Rudy Giuliani's on the screen. He says, if they're wheeling out Giuliani this early, he's losing. <laughs> so it didn't look good. And then I said, well, what's that map of the panhandle of Florida? Are they still voting over there? He said, yeah, they're in their other time zone. I said, are you kidding me? They're calling Florida, or they're about to call Florida for Hillary Clinton, and they haven't counted the panhandle. I was just down there. I was a reporter on the campaign trail for the last part of the campaign with Donald Trump. I was down there. That is deep, deep red country. It's practically Alabama. That's how deep red that country is. I went up to a woman at that rally in Pensacola, Florida, and I asked her the same question I ask everybody when I go to these rallies. Why are you here? Why do you like Donald Trump? And I said to this woman, you know, why are you supporting Donald Trump? And she looked at me cradling a baby in her arms. And she kind of 
waited a second or two and she said, because I'm not an idiot. <laughs> so I knew that she hadn't voted yet, right? If they hadn't counted her vote, Florida could go the other way. And lo and behold, the hour passed and Florida flipped. And suddenly Matt Boyle told me it. an hour before that Trump was going to lose it, he's going to win it, he's going to win it. So, but then Giuliani came down the stairs and he said to the reporters, nothing like this has happened since 1828. And they had no idea what he was talking about. But he was talking about Andrew Jackson. That's what he was talking about. Until then, the presidency of the United States had been held by the elites that had run the country since independence. The Northeastern elites and the Southern plantation elites. And along comes Andrew Jackson, the Westerner. Military man, frontiersman, and he runs and the elites cannot stand it. They just are beside themselves and they don't like him even after he's won. They can't stand the people he brought to the White House. They get their footprints on the furniture. They have rude habits. Sound familiar a little bit? We've been in this movie before and he had a profound impact on American history and we're seeing that every day. I'm going to give you a sneak peek of what my column is about tomorrow. My column, I have a Friday column called Blue State Blues. And my column tomorrow is called The Week That Donald Trump Restored the Republic. That's this week. That's this week. Why did Donald Trump and how did Donald Trump restore the Republic this week? He did two things. First of all, he rescinded DACA. Now, I know from a conservative point of view, it's a debate that's only halfway over, right? Because he sent it to Congress. He said, you have six months to fix this, and we don't know what that fix is going to look like yet. So you might say from a conservative perspective, well, this could be a bad thing if they give us amnesty or whatever. But for me, as a constitutional Tea Party conservative, we're halfway there because he restored the idea of the separation of powers that Barack Obama systematically destroyed for eight years. And and all of a sudden, all these Democrat pundits are on TV admitting, well, the way it happened wasn't right. You didn't hear that from them for eight years or whatever it was. They didn't say it until Trump pointed it out. And now they had to admit it. Yes, Dianne Feinstein, our own senator, says, it's true, DACA is on shaky ground. Oh, really? Why didn't you say anything when he did it? Well, Donald Trump restored that part of our Constitution. And the other thing he did, and this is very controversial, I don't know how you feel about it in this room, probably we'll have some split opinions about it. But he sat down with all the leaders of Congress, he sat down with Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell on one side, and Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, Chuck Schumer on the other, and they said, what are we going to do about this debt ceiling? And the Republicans wanted, I think, an extension of 18 months, and Schumer said, we want three months, and Trump said, okay, we'll go with three months. And, you know, people can't understand it. He agreed with the Democrats. And McConnell and Ryan were beside themselves. What, what does this mean? He went right around us and dealt with the Democrats. Hmm. And, although I don't like Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, and I don't trust him either, nor should you. Uh, I think it's a great thing because it sends a message to McConnell and Ryan. You get your act together. It's a cheap way to do it, right? Because the way that Ryan and McConnell had run this thing, they were going to cave in the end anyway. So Trump just yeah. fast forwarded two weeks and said, look, this is cheap for me to, it's hurricane funding, it's okay? People want this, fine. The Republican caucus has got to know that if people like John McCain come along and decide they're going to be cute and stop the repeal of Obamacare or stop the passage of tax reform because they have a personal fight with the president or whatever it is, it's over. Trump has alternatives. He's got Jeff Flake as an alternative. Uh, sorry, not Jeff Flake, his opponents. Uh, he's got uh, Cherry, Kelly Ward, that's right, and others. Um, but the, the, exactly, not Jeff Flake. What, you know, what a last name that, that is. Uh, anyway. Um, you know, he's, he's, Trump is telling the Republican leaders, if you won't unify your caucus, I will. I will unify them by showing them there is no alternative but what I want to do. And I was elected on this agenda. On Sunday, my boss, Steve Bannon, who's thankfully back with Bright, he's going, uh, you should 
should tune in. If you're not listening to me on Breitbart News Radio on Sirius XM 125, I'll be on at 4 p.m. But also, uh, actually, no, we're in the Pacific time zone, so you can listen to me and then tune to CBS, 7 p.m., Steve Bannon on 60 Minutes. And one of the things he's going to say on 60 Minutes, I know because I've seen their clip, is the Republican establishment has been fighting against the election of 2016 for the last eight months. They do not like it, and they think they can make it go away. Yeah. You know, Greg mentioned that I told him on the radio what makes Breitbart different is that we fight. We fight. Amen. I have to thank you, and it's, it's so incredibly gratifying to drive for two and a half hours from West LA to come here and see this amazing turnout. And I have to thank you for fighting, because although, you might say, well, California, you know, our electoral votes don't matter. You matter. Everything you do matter. The angel moms from California matter. The volunteers from California matter. And you know what? As Andrew Breitbart would have said, the citizen journalism you do, when you go to the rallies, when you have rallies on September 30th, or whenever you're having the Trump rallies, and you get into arguments with protesters, and you videotape them doing what they do, the Antifa people and the Occupy people or whoever, that becomes national news. That's content we use. The citizen journalism you do here matters. You're in the belly of the beast. You're in the deepest blue of deep states. And you are exposing for the rest of the country. Do you know why the debate changed on Antifa? Do you know why it changed? Because a guy named Joey Gibson allowed himself to get beaten up in Berkeley. And then he showed the country that they were the aggressors, that the left-wing Antifa protesters were the violent ones, not the people on the other side. So everything you do matters. And that's what Breitbart, as a website, believes. We fight every single day. You know, there were days a year ago, things didn't look so good for Donald Trump. And I'm openly Trump supporting, even though I've also got a journalistic job to do. You know, I've got to edit, I've got to write the news, and I have to be accurate. They know I'm not objective because I take a side, but I have to be accurate. But, you know, there were days where you're discouraged. You wake up, you look at the news, the polls are terrible. You know, NBC found an old tape from Access Hollywood and Donald Trump, whatever the story is. And whenever I got down, I would say to myself, Find the news. Just find the news, find the news, find the news. There's got to be a way to put one foot in front of the other. Just keep going. What you do at Breitbart every day is you fight. And what you do in the Tea Party every day is you fight. We don't fight because we're necessarily at war. We don't dislike our fellow citizens. We want to persuade our fellow citizens. You mentioned, uh, it was mentioned earlier, a bit of my sordid past as, on the left. Um, I actually had an occasion to read some of my college or immediate post-college writing. I'm, I'm 40 years old now, but back in my early 20s, I was very much on the left. And in fact, I, I barely participated in the college Democrats because they were too centrist for me. And uh, I was very much on the left. And it took 10 years, but after a lot of political experiences I had and a lot of community service experiences I had where I went out into communities and saw the policies I believed in being enacted and saw that they were having the opposite effect of the one that was advertised and the wheels started to turn. And it's because I was a true believer that I changed my mind. A lot of my friends from college who are still on the left didn't really take the left-wing ideas so seriously. It's kind of a posture. They may live like wealthy people who want to pay lower taxes, but they vote like liberals because it makes them feel better. I really believed. And I took a scientific approach to it. I believed what they were doing would work. And when I saw it didn't, I went back to the original idea and had to rethink it. And I went back at my 10th college reunion and I saw a lot of the kids, now adults, who were Republicans in college. And I remember, I remembered every argument I had with them. I remembered every single one in college. And I thought that I had won those arguments, but they stuck in my brain for years and years. And I thought, and I thought, and I rethought. And I said to my friends at this reunion, you know, I've been thinking about what you said to me for 10 years, and you are right. And they just laughed because they could barely remember. But the point is, when you're engaging your fellow citizens, they may disagree with you today, but if you put things in a way that leaves the right impression, you can convince them tomorrow as they go forward. And if you can disagree respectfully, forcefully, but respectfully, you can win, you can change minds, you can change the world. That's what we do at Breitbart. 
Now, let me just get into the book a little bit, how Trump won. It's important to remember how we won because he has to fight every day, and, and it's important to remind Republicans because they still don't know how to win. But there's basically three big reasons I go into in the book, and I co-wrote the book with Larry Schweikart. I don't know if you know Larry. He wrote The Patriot's History to the United States. He's a uh, retired historian. He wrote that book, Patriot's History, in answer to Howard Zinn's People's History, which is kind of a left-wing revisionist version of history, you know, yeah. all slavery, discrimination, colonialism, we're awful people. So Larry wrote the counter to that, which is a, a totally uh, accurate and positive take on American history, and I partnered with him in writing this book. And basically three things, how Trump won. Number one. Trump talked about issues nobody was talking about. Republicans weren't talking about them, and Democrats were generally not talking about them. Now, I want to tell you a story that involves the angel moms, and I'm so glad some of them are here because they're so integral to this story of how Trump won. Trump declared his candidacy, came down the escalator on June 16, 2015, and for three or four weeks after that, he was at the bottom of the polls. Hard to remember that, right? But if you look at real clear politics at that time, I don't know how many of you go onto that website, they have pretty good polling data. He was bumping along the bottom. You know, he was behind uh, Mike Huckabee, uh, Rand Paul, I think, was neck and neck with him. He was, he was down there, he wasn't really going anywhere. And then he had a meeting with this group called the Remembrance Project. It was on July 10th, 2015. The Remembrance Project are families who have lost loved ones to crimes by illegal aliens. And what, why did he meet this, I mean this tells you how everything's connected, why did he meet this group? Because 10 days before that, a young woman named Kate Steinle was killed, was murdered by an illegal alien who had been deported seven times. And he picked up a gun and shot her on a pier in San Francisco, no reason. And we at Breitbart covered that story, and we made that front page news at Breitbart, and we forced the media to cover it. Thank you. And Michelle Moons, who's a California-based reporter, she's now in D.C. You might see her at the White House briefing every once in a while. She's a blonde woman, usually stands on the side. She had gone, you know her, right? She had gone to the immigration protests for a year, two years. She covered that story. She elevated that story to national news. Well, who saw that? Donald Trump saw that. And so Donald Trump sought out the families of the Remembrance Project. And there's a famous photograph of him meeting the families, standing there with his arms folded in front of him, looking very concerned. I remember the name of the photographer. It wasn't a Breitbart photographer. It was an Associated Press photographer. That picture went around the world. And within nine days, Donald Trump had gone from number six in the polls at about six and a half percent straight to number one, and he never looked back. And it's because Trump was talking about illegal immigration and nobody else was. Um, why, why did that resonate? Well, not everybody, thank goodness, not everybody knows someone who's lost someone to an illegal alien, but Everybody in America knows some way in which the government has let them down. Where the government promised to do something, promised to protect them and let them down. Whether it was terrorism, you know, we kept being told this wasn't terrorism, it was gun violence, or uh, whatever, whatever you, workplace violence, whatever they called it. Whether it was Obamacare, they were promised insurance, they didn't get it, or it was too expensive. Everybody felt the government had promised all this stuff and had let them down. And so that resonated because a lot of Americans felt victimized by their government. Trade was another issue. Now I happen to have pretty libertarian views on trade, but look at who Trump was talking to. And look what happened in a place like Michigan, for example. Bernie Sanders went to Michigan and had similar positions to Trump on some of the trade issues like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Bernie Sanders stole Michigan from under Hillary Clinton's nose in the primary. She was up 20% in the polls the day before they went to vote. And he won. How did that happen? Trade. The voters who showed up were angry about trade and they didn't trust her on trade. Those same voters, what do you think they did in November? You think they voted for Hillary Clinton? Well, Michigan went to Trump. That tells you some of those Bernie Sanders voters went over to Trump because of trade. 
And he was talking about the issues that the Republican establishment and the Democratic establishment in Washington decided were already settled, done deal. You know, if you read the Republican autopsy, they called it, after 2012. Oh, we lost in 2012. What should we do to win in 2016? I know. Let's pass amnesty. That was page one or two of the report. It was just kind of, they kind of slipped it in there. Um, no debate, nothing. It was just assumed that they had to do this. And Trump said, no, this is, this is something we've got to debate. So that's reason number one uh, that he won. The other two reasons, uh, reason number two, Twitter, <laughs> okay? Uh, how many of you would like Trump to stop tweeting? No! no. <laughs> exactly. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe edit a little bit, but uh, Trump used Twitter and other means to go right over the heads of the mainstream media. He said to them, I'm not going to go through you as a filter, I'm going to talk directly to the people. And he did that also at his rallies. You know, if you went to a Trump rally, how many of you went to Trump rallies? You know, right, first of all, what, what was something you noticed about Trump rallies? What, what did he do that was different from other politicians? Anything? He shook hands? Okay, that's, so he got individuals to stand up and take the microphone from him. That's something nobody did. A couple other things he did. He, he showed up on time. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Oh, okay, I know that sounds kind of strange. Why is that a factor? Well, let me tell you. When I ran for Congress, as you heard about my narrow loss earlier, <laughs> I was told by campaign consultants, here's what you do. You need to create a sense of mystique about the candidate so people will donate money to spend time with you and think that you're great, greater than you actually are. So what you need to do is, you need to start late. Even if you're there on time, sit in a back room and wait 20 minutes, that way the audience anticipates you and you can show up and you can impress them. And then don't speak for very long, speak 15 minutes at most and then leave. Trump did exactly the opposite. He showed up on time and he spoke for an hour. Now, if you're standing in that audience and you've driven, you know, 200 miles to be there or whatever, that makes you feel important. Here's a guy who's a billionaire celebrity, could be doing anything else, and he's giving his time to you and he's telling you by starting on time that your time is worth something to him. And when I would ask people in the audience, once I asked these two young girls in Detroit why they were at this rally, again, same question, why are you here? And they said to me, because he loves us. And I said, how do you know he loves you? And they said, because he doesn't have to do this. And by showing up on time and spending quality time with the audience, he sent everybody there the message that he cared about them. And that's how people really felt and still feel. The third reason he won, and you all know this, and we've alluded to it earlier, he just worked harder than Hillary Clinton and everybody else. Yeah. You know, I was on the campaign press plane, okay? I was with all these reporters who hated Donald Trump, and they were convinced he was going to lose. And man, it was fun on election night to see their faces. But, you know, uh, they would all tell you privately they would much rather have covered Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton simply because she was so boring. She was really, really boring. She would do one event a day, maybe, and it would be the set piece with the bleachers in the right position and the audience strategically placed behind her to get the right sort of diversity tableau or whatever it was. It was also stage managed, and Trump was doing five events a day to seven different states. And really, I mean, it was a carnival. It was so much fun. It was crazy. You know, there'd be fights at the edge of the crowd. You know, the police would have to carry people away. There'd be these crazy characters showing up. It was, it was unbelievable. It was fun. Even they had fun despite themselves. It was a great time. But it was because he was working hard. That's why it was fun for them. He was not resting. He exhausted these young reporters, some of whom were a third of his age. So those are the three basic reasons. But if you go into the book, there's so many other interesting things. One of the interesting things Larry points out, now Larry called the election in August 2015. That's 15 months before anybody voted. He said Trump's gonna win. Why is Trump gonna win? Because he was looking at voter registration data. All of these Democrats in Northeastern Ohio and places like that were switching their registrations to Republican, hundreds of thousands. And you know what, they're still doing it. Larry Schweiker will tell you today that if the election were held today, never mind the polls, the approval numbers or whatever, Trump would win again by a bigger margin. Simple, it's just plain old 
school politics he is delivering for the people who elected him. The voters in the Rust Belt states that were the hardest hit by Obama's climate change policy that gave the vote. You know, by the way, Trump did best in the counties that had the highest percentage of military casualties. Think about that. Okay? They trust him as commander-in-chief. They do not trust the Democrats who won't name the enemy. And Trump is building his support there, not diminishing it, not losing it. So that's the story of what's continued to happen. Now, I know we have limited time, and I, I know there's so many other things. We've got another great speaker from the Election Integrity Project, which I think will be fascinating. By the way, I spend a lot of time in South Africa. I grew up, grew up in Chicago, went to college here, then I went back there. I worked there for several years. They have photo ID in South Africa, okay? One of them. Yeah. Poor, poor African country has photo ID. Okay? <laughs> so, so don't tell me, you know, <laughs> we can't do it here. Um, but. It's really interesting. Let's talk about Breitbart for a second and Steve Bannon. Yeah. So, uh, Steve's a big reason that Trump won. I, I think that Steve brought discipline to the Trump campaign just like he brings discipline to Breitbart. He's got a lot of drive. He's got a lot of leadership. He's a tough son of a you-know-what to work for, but that's how the best always are. I know the veterans in the room have worked for a few. <laughs> and those are the best leaders sometimes. They're not always personable in the trenches. They'll be the nicest, biggest teddy bears, you know, when you're home or you're at the bar sharing a beer or whatever. Steve doesn't drink, by the way. But uh, they're tough. You need to be tough. You need to be tough to fight in this business because you don't get points for artistic impression. You don't get points for miscongeniality. You get points by winning, by taking scalps, by counting votes. And that's how we win. And Steve's back at Breitbart, as he said, he's got his hands back on his weapons now. And we are going to go places. I don't know if you've noticed, there's a bit of a gap in conservative media lately, just a bit. So many of the networks, so many of the other publications decided that it would be better to trash Donald Trump for whatever reason they had, whether it was they had their own candidates they liked better, or because they decided that somehow they didn't like his ideas, or whatever it was. Different reasons for different people, who knows. There were a lot of candidates I could have voted for, by the way. Trump wasn't my only choice. He wasn't even my first choice. I, I, you know, I know certainly in the Inland Empire, if you, if you look at the polls, Ted Cruz had a lot of support. Ted Cruz, constitutional conservative, lots of other good candidates. Um, but you know, at Breitbart, we didn't rule any of them out. Well, you know, Jeb Bush, we kind of ruled them out. <laughs> And, and, and John Kasich, although he was always more tame. But, by the way, Arnold Schwarzenegger endorsed John Kasich. Didn't that swing a few votes? Um, you know, I love it. I love this, uh, you know, Kasich's fun. Can we, can we just spend a minute on John Kasich? You know, Donald Trump should thank John Kasich in a way, because if you look at how the primary shook out, what was the big problem for Donald Trump's opponents in the primary, right? Donald Trump for a while never got above 40% in the primary, so theoretically, 60% of Republicans at one point wanted somebody else. The problem was that Marco Rubio had some of them, Ted Cruz had some of them, and John Kasich had this little thin little sliver of them. And because Kasich wouldn't drop out and endorse one or the other of Rubio and Cruz, Donald Trump just kept winning. So in a funny kind of way, he helped he helped Donald Trump win, but um, obviously without intending to. Um, but look, Breitbart, I'll, I'll announce here something that, uh, not yet public, so you're the first to hear it. Um, but we will be starting, in addition to our morning news show, which is very early in California, 6 o'clock a.m. to 9 o'clock a.m. Excuse me, it's 6 to 9 Eastern. It's 3 a.m. here to 6 a.m. here. Um, so, you know, it's too early for anybody, although I, I have woken up to host that show at 2.45 in the morning. Um, but we will be starting an evening show. It's going to be the same channel right after Mark Levin on Sirius XM 125 from 6 p.m. Pacific to 9 p.m. Pacific. It's Breitbart News Tonight. And I will be co-hosting it with Rebecca Manso. And uh, we are going to continue expanding on the web, on the radio, maybe in some other media as well. And I feel great. You know, when people say, what's it like having Steve Bannon back at Breitbart? Well, first of all, Steve, let's just talk about him in the White House. Steve was the backbone of the Trump administration. He was the personification of the Trump agenda. And I hope that that has remained behind in the White House, even with him not there. 
We have to keep the pressure on. That's how we view our role as, as right We're not cheerleaders. We believe in the movement, we believe in the agenda, we believe in you. And we want to represent the things that brought Trump to power, the people that voted for him, not the person. But when he does the right thing, we will cheer very loudly and unabashedly for him. But Steve, coming back to Brightford, I, I, I said to people, it's like LeBron James coming back to the Cleveland Cavaliers. You know, He won on the biggest stage in the world, and now we feel like we can do anything. With him on our side, we can win anything, do anything, conquer anything. Get rid of Ryan. Get rid of Ryan. Yeah. We'll see, you know. The, the, I, I gotta say this, there's a great tradition, and maybe our next speaker will talk about it since he comes from the parliamentary system. There's a great tradition in the British parliamentary system of resigning. You know, if you say you're gonna do something and it doesn't happen, you resign. Yep. So, you know, I wanna just plant the idea out there. Mitch McConnell promised to deliver Obamacare. It didn't happen. You know, in Britain, he probably wouldn't be there anymore. Just saying, it's just a tradition. I'd like to see it brought back. <laughs> you know, the honorable resignation. It's not saying I failed. It's just saying others could lead better. And, and I think it's, it's what you have to do. Uh, you know, my wife would say in the Navy, even if, if you have a mess of any kind, whether it's a, your room's dirty or you know some tool wasn't put away, which is a big problem if you're working on a on a ship on, a, on an air deck. You just volunteer that it's your fault. You don't point fingers at each other and you don't pretend it didn't happen. You step forward and you take responsibility for it. And we need more leaders to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I want to I wanna open up for questions. I'm running a little over time. Let, that's my favorite thing to do is answer questions. I fear I've spoken too long, but let me answer a few. And then we will have a short period to sign and sell books. I've got about 50 of those books. I'd love to sell all of them. They're $15. It's a discount. So I do hope I have cash. We can do credit, whatever you want. Um, let's have, how many questions? Three questions? Is that a good amount? Cool. We'll see, we'll see how we do. We'll see how we're pretty, pretty pleased to have, have yours. I'll get on with the first question. Okay. We see, and I think this is part of what Mike White right for our shared line is, we see the unified reaction of urgency of the entire ruling class. We've got to help the DACA illegals. That does not exist for the age of arms. It does not exist for the 70,000 factories that were closed since 2000. 2000. It does not exist to secure the border, provide better schools, or anything else. But if you look at them jump, when it comes to, we have to help the DACA illegals. The Republican Party fears the media. They fear the media. And their political actions are constrained by that fear. And the great thing about Donald Trump and Steve Bannon helping him was he did what Andrew Breitbart would have loved to do, which is to see right through the media and ignore their fear tactics, as Greg was saying earlier, ignore the names they call you, and just press forward. If something's right to do, it's right to do. And you know, people said this thing about Andrew, when they tried to figure out what Andrew would have felt about Donald Trump, there was this old clip of him on Fox News where he said Donald Trump's not a conservative, and so people used that during the campaign. Oh, Andrew Breitbart said Donald Trump's not a conservative. But Andrew Breitbart said something else that people forgot about, but you can find it it's still on Twitter, he tweeted about it. He said Donald Trump sees through the media. He sees that the media and their racist label, they were using race a lot against the Tea Party, as you know, um, he sees that their racist label is empty and he sees right through them and that's why he's successful. Donald Trump gets it. And that's what Republicans don't get. So instead of thinking about what's best for the country in DACA, they're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be labeled a racist or a xenophobe or whatever. You've got to stand up to it. You've got to stand up to it. If there are humanitarian reasons to make some compromises, okay, but don't don't fall for nonsense. There was a woman on TV on MSNBC, which I watch all the time, but I like to watch what the opposition is doing. Um, there was a woman interviewed, she said she was a DACA recipient. Okay, they're interviewing her, she's protesting in LA. And they said, well, why are you here at this protest? She said, well, I'm angry because now my future is in jeopardy, and my husband's in the army, and he just got deployed to Afghanistan, and he's gonna worry while he's fighting for our country that his wife could get deported. I'm scratching my head and thinking, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense at all. Your husband's in the military. I presume he's an American citizen, and even if he's not, the military has an accelerated program of citizenship for permanent residents. So if you're in the military, and you're fighting overseas, and you're married, you can immigrate legally. Why are you at this protest? 
go down to the U.S. Citizen Immigration Services, fill out the forms, pay the fee, and do what everybody else does. Why do you have to protest it? So, you know, you've got to call them out when they make up these stories. Anyway, walk towards the fire. That's how you got to do it. Agnes. Hi, I was one of the angel moms that went to Paul, Ryan, Paul uh, Ryan's home, and he cowardly drove off, wouldn't even acknowledge us. What can we do from here to get him out of office? I think the most important thing to do um, is find an alternative candidate. You know, when I talked to um, Republicans a couple years ago, I was doing a book about the Tea Party, actually. It's an e-book, if you want to read that one. It's called um, Wacko Birds. That's what it's called. Wacko Bird. Why, why Wacko Birds? Because that's what John McCain called the Tea Party. Um, and my Wacko Bird, of course, is a screaming eagle on the front of the cover. That's my, that's how, eagles sound pretty crazy. They're also pretty cool. Um, I was interviewing Republicans, and one of them told me, I won't say who it is because it was an off-the-record or sort of private comment, but he said, look, those who can serve as speaker don't want to, and those who want to can't do it. So the question has always been, who's the alternative? By the way, Ryan wasn't speaker at that time. John Boehner was speaker at that time. So the question is always, who is the alternative? And I just saw it today, in the, uh, I think it was USA Today or something, talking about Mark Meadows as a possible alternative. Look, Ryan and McConnell have, if objectively, whether you like them or not as people or politicians, whatever, they failed to deliver on the agenda. I wrote a piece in, in November last year after Trump won. I said, very optimistically, I'm very optimistic at that point. Oh, I'm over the moon, everything's great. I said, look at these great bills that Ryan passed when Obama was in office. The repeal of Obamacare, the dealing with the deficit and the debt. This is amazing. All Trump has to do is sign these bills and it'll be a successful presidency. Except they didn't introduce those bills again, right? They, they voted to repeal Obamacare and they didn't have the guts to put the same bill on the table. Now that might actually pass. So, you know, you've got to find other leaders if you want to challenge that. That's the thing to do. Mark Meadows is a name. Louis Gomer, I heard someone shout. Um, but they, yeah, Nalen, okay, so the problem with, I mean, he's a great guy. I don't know if he's running again. The problem is that he lost by, he lost by a large margin in, in, in what he primary in mind. Maybe he'd have better success now, I don't know. But the question is always, as Bill Clinton says, and, and Bill Clinton, whatever his other flaws, is a very astute and shrewd politician. The question is always, compared to what? So you've got to have the what. You've got to have the what. Jerry. Yeah, hi. I was just wondering, why did President Trump fire Steve Bannon? So, Steve actually resigned, and he resigned earlier than, um, than was reported, and he kind of resigned, I think, a week or ten days before Charlottesville, and it was, uh, it was all kind of the shakeout after Charlottesville, but he, had, he was... Steve told people at Breitbart that he only expected to be there for a year. Um, he wasn't... he didn't see himself as a permanent fixture. Um, I do think that what happened was, in some ways, um, some of the people that Trump hired, um, Gary Cohn and, and some of the other people, um, did not work well and did not want to work with Steve. I think that's from what I can tell. Um, and, and that was a challenge because, you know, Lincoln brought together this team of rivals. Um, there's a great story, if you read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, highly recommended, about the Civil War. He had a team of rivals. And there was this one guy who was really Lincoln's backbone. He was so pro-Lincoln, he was a fantastic guy, and Lincoln made him postmaster general, which was at the time a very important post. He was one of the best postmaster generals we've ever had. We still have a post, I don't know who, does, who has it now, but anyway. It was at Montgomery Blair, Montgomery Blair. And he was really a Lincoln guy, and the others in the cabinet didn't like him. They didn't get along with him. And eventually, to secure agreement among the others on some policy or another, I forget which one it was, Lincoln had to ask Montgomery Blair to resign. And Blair resigned because he wanted to do the best thing for his president and his country. And at that point, there were no hard feelings about it. And I think that's how it was with Steve, where he parted in a way to allow Trump to manage this team he had now pulled together, because there were things that Steve had partly set in motion that had to happen a certain way. And look, I think it's a loss for the Trump administration, and I don't know what some of these people are doing there. I mean, I can talk about Gary Cohn, why, you know. I don't, I don't mind having someone who's not a hardcore conservative in the administration bring another perspective, but he's constantly running the president down in public. I mean, he said bad things about him after Charlottesville. He said that Trump, 
didn't understand climate change or something like that. I mean, why do you have, anyway, so I'm not going to get into, I, don't, I try not to pick winners and losers, but I think that it's a big loss to the administration. I was sorry to see it happen, but boy, am I happy to have it back at Breitbart. Alvin, you Thanks a lot. So we've got people who are watching other parts of the country right now. Uh, we understand you. Good. We understand you grew up in Illinois. So really bad news. A Republican quote unquote governor signed off on sanctuary state. What are your thoughts on that? And what can we do? Because we're facing that same dilemma. What do we do to stop this and reverse this terrible pattern in these blue states? What are your thoughts? So two questions in a sense. Your reaction to your home state going sanctuary, and what do we do as conservatives to stop this destructive policy? Because we're facing it too. Right, so two, two reactions to that. Uh, one is that if Bruce Rauner thinks that going sanctuary is going to save him in the re-election campaign, he's dead wrong. Because the people who voted for him are not going to show up. They're not going to show up, and he needs those votes. A Republican can only win in Illinois by the slimmest of margins. And if you lose the people who are most active, people like the people in this room, you can forget about it. And by the way, I had my doubts about Bruce Rauner from the beginning. Even though it was great to see a Republican win and all that stuff, his first speech to the Illinois legislature, I wrote an article about it, saying that while he said some good things about budgets and taxes and so forth, he had this thing where he was bending over backwards on political correctness and race and that kind of thing. I thought, you can't do that. You cannot bow to the other side's crazy identity politics because that shows you can be defeated on just about anything. And, and lo and behold, here we are. I mean, sanctuary state, how do you beat it? It's, it's just completely illegal and unconstitutional and it's going to lose in the courts. California will lose in the courts. And I think that this is a fight that Trump's going to win. The thing is though, You've got to have people who stick together with him and support him and push him on that and tell him not to give up. And Rauner, for whatever reason, has turned his back on those people, and I don't think it's going to go very well. No one else there, so I will take the honor of the last question. Okay. I asked you on the radio show, are we winning or losing the war, the long war, for the soul of America? I know what your answer is. So the second part is, how do we win? So my answer, I think, was we're losing, right? We're losing the long war. Yes, we're losing the long war. Because, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your children or grandchildren and mine are being taught to hate this country, and they're not being taught the history of this country. And worst of all, they're being taught to hate themselves. And, and I want to elaborate a little bit about that, now that we have an, uh, an opportunity to share this kind of story. but. When my wife went to college, she studied economics. And she complained to me about her economic history course. She took a course in economic history. And she said, my professor is telling us the craziest things. And I didn't believe her until I went with her to class one day just to see what was going on. And this professor was telling these young students, this is at Harvard University, okay? He's telling these young students, about the internet, it was one of the last lectures of the year, you know, they start with the 1600s, they get to the 20th century. The internet, government created the internet. Oh. And all these guys in Silicon Valley who made all this money, they did it because of government. And they just basically stole all this money from the public, etc. And I said, how can you tell young people at the college that produced Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, they wrote their programs in their dorm rooms, both Gates and Zuckerberg. How can you tell these people, any one of whom could be one of those future entrepreneurs, that it's not them, they don't do it, it's the government? How could you undermine them like that? And you know what happens to those kids? Most of them don't become Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, that's fine. Most of them, especially at Harvard, go on to Wall Street jobs, management consulting, legal jobs, and they make a lot of money. And do you know how they feel about themselves when they make a lot of money? They feel bad about themselves. They like the money, but they feel they've done something wrong because that's what they've been told. They've been told success is wrong. They've been told that if you succeed, it's because you took it from somebody else. That's what our country is telling young people. And I had a kind of epiphany that day. You know, I'm very pro-Israel. And I was worried... And 
our, our campuses are terrible. I mean, there's some terrible stuff going on on campus about Israel. A lot of the anti-Israel uh, organizations are organized. They have a lot of money. They have outside organizers. A lot of the Muslim American students, I'm sorry to say, they come, their parents come from countries that hated Israel, hated Jews, and they bring that to campus. Some of them are very nice people. Some of them don't have those views. But a lot of the young uh, anti-Israel activists on campus draw from there. Um, anyway, when I sat in on that lecture, I realized the problem on, on my particular issue at the time, which was Israel, the problem wasn't that college students were taught to hate Israel. The problem was that college students were taught to hate America. Why is that the problem? Because if you are told that success and failure are determined by a hidden group of people, and not by your own individual effort. They're determined by the government or by, you know, some little cabal on Wall Street that manipulates everything or whatever. You will eventually develop those prejudices. They will come out of that mistaken belief. If you believe, for example, like the Egyptians did and the Syrians did, that the only way Israel could have beaten them in war was if it had some control over the world's media and Jews controlled the world, all this you know, anti-Semitic stuff. Instead of saying, hey, these guys beat us because they're tougher and they're fighting, they're fighting and they, they built an economy and they built weapons and they know how to, you know. Instead of just seeing success for what it is, they have to invent a conspiracy theory. When you teach people that America's success is a conspiracy, which is what kids are told, you are ingraining, you're, you're building the thought process in their minds that leads to prejudice and hatred. That's the truth. That the way the left thinks is germane to hatred. The way you think is not racist. You are, none of the people in this room are racist. The way you think is germane to liberty and freedom and overcoming racism. The way that you think liberates a black child in a poor community in a failing school to succeed on his or her own merit. Right. You've liberated that individual. That's, that's the mentality of freedom. That's, that's the creed of the Tea Party, which was described earlier. It's the opposite of racism because it, it upholds the Judeo-Christian idea of the dignity of the individual. Yes. We are losing that battle on campuses. But we can win it. And the way we win it is through social media, through new websites like Breitbart, through activities like you're doing today. Millennials, there's, there, there's no doubt most of them are left, but there's also a backlash. We have a huge number of millennial readers in Breitbart. You know, you guys may have heard of Milo Yiannopoulos, who used to work at Breitbart. He was pulling in all these millennial kids because they were rebels, right? Young people like to rebel. And what were they rebelling against? They were rebelling against political correctness. They could tell there was something wrong. They didn't know what it was. The young people want to rebel, and right now the orthodoxy of these colleges is politically correct, is anti-American, and you'll find enough rebels in that crowd who will want to join you and walk alongside you. That's how you start to win. We're losing, but we can't win. Um, yeah. With that, let me close. I've, I've spoken too long, but I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to stand over there. The books are $15. I take cash and credit. I want to just close by thanking you again. And uh, thank you for your, activi uh, your activism. Thank you for your sacrifice for the veterans and the angel moms. Um, and, and thank you for your prayers. I know we're all thinking about Florida and Texas. And, um, you know, I always think, you know, we're just one earthquake away from being that news story. So we have to all stick together and, and help each other. And uh, I think we're all united. And it feels good to be that way, even at these times. Thanks so much.